Okay, so good afternoon to you all. My name is Jo Paul and I'm from Quill. I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar on Quill Forms, which are powered by Form Evo. Quill Forms are launched within Interactive and are also cloud-based, which given the current climate we're all working under, enables you to carry on providing a service to your clients. You're all muted, however, if you do have any questions during the webinar, you can ask us by following the simple instructions which you can currently see on the screen. And we'll answer those questions at the end of the session. I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague, Paul Clyde, who will take over the demo from here. Thank you, Joe. Let me just move these things out the way. So you should now be able to see uh, the home page of the Quill Forms module. So just to give you a brief um, intro as to what's contained here, it's a combination of the traditional electronic form, which you can simply download as a PDF and print off in the traditional use. Uh, but you've also got uh, digital forms included here as well. And the digital forms are covering areas such as stamp duty, company's house, uh, and the land registry. And my colleague Archie is going to talk you through the digital forms in due course. What I'm going to do is just briefly in the next few minutes talk about the electronic component of Formevo and how to navigate around and some of the functionality. So this is the home screen and within it, you've got the ability to search for new forms. You can build up a component of a, your favorite forms. The system automatically identifies the most used forms that um, you're accessing. And you can also build a series of template forms. So where there is consistent information that is being used within a form, save it once as a template, and then you've got access going forwards uh, to use that form again and again. In terms of the uh, content, let me briefly show you what's available here. So this is the library of forms, and it's quite easy to just scroll through, select a particular area you're interested in, and you can drill down into the component areas and pick up the form there simply by double clicking on the form itself. The other option is to do a search, and I'm going to do a search for a TR1 just to show you some differences around the forms. So from this search, what you can see here is that we have various versions of a TR1 that you can build up. So you have a TR1, the standard form, um, but the more commonly used one is the expandable version so that you can add as much text as you like within the boxes and then the form itself will repaginate. And if I wanted to save that as one of my favorites, it's just a case of clicking on the gold star to pull it up. But equally, you can see here, we've got expandable versions of forms that we've saved as templates. So quite easy to build up different options using the one form. I'm going to open up a version of the form and it defaults to asking me for a client file reference. So I'll just put something in here for now and then I can open the form up and it's very much the traditional looking uh, form that you're used to. Some of the additional bits of functionality, however, that you may be interested in is if I go to the next page, I've got the ability to build my own clause library that I can then use within a form. So go to the bottom right and corner, click the, on insert predefined text, and then I've got the option to have built this in a way so that it's either personal to me, departmental, or by organization. Click onto it, there's my library and I can drop that information in really simply. So it's, it's a good way of creating additional efficiencies within using the form itself. If I go to the next page, you'll see that we have various attestation clauses and I can simply select any of those that I want. And uh, now with certain forms, what we're building up is a library of word versions of the forms. So just click onto the print word version and there we have it. I can open that in Word and I can then 
uh, start to work on that form within that uh, air common environment. But you can see now I've opened it up that as I work my way through it, you can see we've added in the uh, clause and then on the next page, there's the attestation clauses for you. So it's, it's all there, very easy to access. I'll close this particular form down and just show you uh, within this existing form section here, this is where I've got my draft forms. And one thing that's very useful at the moment is if we had a situation where a Formevo client had one of their users who was sick and other people needed to access their forms, subject to permissions, it's very easy to do. All I need to do is search by the individuals who've created the form. So in this case, I'm going to uh, click on Archie and search for all of his forms. And that will bring up um, all of his forms that are now available for me to finish off in Archie's absence. So really, really useful um, if there is a, the circumstances where unfortunately someone has taken ill. So I'm just going to go back now and into the all of the forms. So I just let this open up and I briefly wanted to show you the IHT 400 module. And I don't know if anyone heard myself and Archie talking before, but one of the things we were just talking about was that we're hearing that uh, as of today, you will not have to have a wet ink ink signature um, on the IHT. So that's something to look into if this form is relevant to you. Um, but in terms of this form, what I'm able to do with it is I can collate it into a bundle of the core 400 form and then any supplementary forms. So to give an example, we've put some basic information into the form here. And if I just go to the top, you can see that I've got a bundle situation here. So if I click on a 406, it will open the 406, it will auto populate, and also it will start to do auto calculations. So it's got those two figures there, puts it to 9,000, and then there's a requirement to put the nine into box 52 within the 400. And if I go back uh, to the 400, you will see, I go to the relevant page, which is page seven, I believe. And if I scroll down, you will see that what it's done is it's pulled that information through. So that can be an incredible way of uh, speeding up the whole process. I've heard firms say to me that has taken 75% of the time out of um, working on that particular form. The final thing that I want to show you today in this brief kind of taster is the ability to share a form. So I'm going to take classic form for sharing at the moment, which is the TA6. So here is our form. And again, what I've done with it is I've created it within a bundle, which means I'm going to save having to rekey in data into different forms. So you can see if I click on a TA7, it's pulled all of that information through into the form. So it saves you only having to put the information in once. So let's go back to our TA6. And if I did want to share this, this form with one of my clients in a remote environment, it's pretty easy to do. So what I'm going to do is I will go to share and I've got the ability either to give permission to share the form for comments being added or for actual editing as well. So I'm going to click on editing and I shall just put in Archie's email address, okay. And then his mobile number here, because we're going to use two-factor authentication. So that's the information added. If I want to put some comments in here, I can do so. And I'm now going to send this to Archie. So as you can see, that's been sent. So Archie will now start his presentation um, by covering off as if he was the client. And for him to do that, I need to close and to log out.
So what I'm now going to do is hand across to Archie. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul, can you just confirm you can see my email and? I can see yours. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Very good. Uh, so um, here we have the email that Paul has sent, and um, I'm uh, simulating being the client uh, on this TA6, but it could be any form. And uh, there are two levels of assurance that this email is valid and is expected. Um, the, as a best practice point of view, um, it's important to pre-warn the client that you're going to share a form with them so that they, they know to expect it. And here we can see that we've got Paul's name here from Courage & Co Solicitors. And this is uh, the signature file um, for uh, your law firm's emails. Um, so the client um, is one, expecting the email, two, gets an email referencing you, the fee earner, for example, from your firm, and your firm's email signature is at the bottom as well. So that, that gives them a level of um, surety that this is okay to click on this link. So I'm going to click on that link. And in terms of form share, it's going to come uh, to this screen here, whereby um, your firm's details uh, and, and the user is in that top right hand corner. It's also in the middle. The user recognizes their last four digits of their phone number and goes, yep, OK, this looks OK. Send me my validation code. And this is 2FA. 2FA means two factor authentication. So one of um, today's concerns around security of web pages and of emails is that you need two forms of authentication to satisfy you that it really is a valid uh, link or, or email. And um, so here we're going to get an email address that also ties up with a phone number. So those are the two elements that will make the um, connection uh, credible and secure. So I've got my message there on my phone, I've put it in, and now I can see a kind of a light version of, of Formivo. Here is my TA6. This is the details that um, Paul had already put in. And I might click in here and realize that Paul has missed out um, a, a middle name for Brian James John Smith. And I can put that in there. And then I'm going to go to page three and I'm going to tick some boxes. Uh, so these all belong to the seller and uh, plan um, attached, whatever it happens to be. And I'm going to save that. I can print it. Uh, so the um, client can always get themselves back to a, a PDF. And there it is there. Um, I'm in draft mode. So that's why it's got the watermark down the side. And um, I can now close that and uh, come out of that. And that will allow me to go back into um, Formivo. So I'm now, in effect, um, Paul. And I'm just going to do a quick search um, for Paul, like we've already described um, before. And uh, here we go. It's looking for them. There is the TA6. And um, lo and behold, there is John. That is the, the, the name that I've added in. And if I go to page three, I can see the tick boxes and the, the content that um, I, simulating the client, have filled in. And so this is what we're calling document distancing. Obviously, it's um, trying to avoid the client coming to the, to the office to discuss the form. It's allowing you to share the form. And um, very soon, you'll be able to electronically sign the form. And our little preamble, as people were joining this webinar, was all about the different um, government agencies, Legal Aid Board, um, HMRC as regards IHT and tomorrow land registry have a big conference all about electronic signatures and that the, the the changing technological need of having to have the client come into the office or physically have a client fill in a piece of paper where somebody else then also has to sign it or witness it and that sort of thing. Um, so that is what form share is all about. And form share can be applied to either electronic forms, i.e. those that output to a PDF or to digital forms. And as Paul introduced me to talk about digital forms, uh, we should jump screen now to our SDLT dashboard. SDLT is the ultimate digital form. 
2008 saw the digitization of stamp duty land tax, 2018 saw the digitization and the devolution of land transaction tax, which is um, the Welsh equivalent of SDLT. And talking of the Welsh equivalent, we can see here on the dashboard, if I make the screen a little bit bigger, you can see you've got um, form identifiers in green and one here in red. That means this is a Welsh one and these are all English ones. And I'm going to go into um, uh, one that um, we've prepared earlier, demo three. So you can um, sort your SDLTs or LTTs by um, branch, by user, by your reference, uh, or by country. Um, so here's one that I've already done, and I can see that there's an EAP1 attached to this particular SDLT. And as you'll all well uh, know, that in stamp duty land tax, the names and addresses are all reused in an AP1. And if it's a commercial uh, transaction, the names and, um, are also reused in an MR01 if there is a charge um, against that um, transaction. Um, and this broach is a subject of data flow of HMRC via SDLT, um, of AP1 via the land reg, and of um, uh, company's house via an MRO1. Um, so I'm just going to um, just change. Uh, this one's already been done. So via an, so if um, company's house uh, are involved and there's an MRO1 required because there is a lender, then you've got um, company's house. So the, the detail, which is fundamentally names and addresses all here listed in these tabs, um, that data doesn't need to be retyped. It just flows from one government agency and their form to another government agency and their form. Um, just for now, I've got to um, illustrate the tabs that um, are shown here, tax, lease, land, vendor, are represented um, as per the paper form, which is here. So these um, uh, titles within the form, leases, calculation, and so forth, land, they are represented by these tabs here. And there are some, uh, as you'd expect, and there are some additional uh, functions within this particular SDLT form, which are to do with the Law Society CQS 1.2 requirement. So for all those that uh, handle conveyancing um, and are Law Society CQS members, uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, the Law Society is conducting a uh, random selection of testing of CQS of, um, uh, membership in 2020, and they have plans in 2021 to assess or reassess every single CQS member, and therefore every member will want to um, make themselves confident that they know all about the Law Society CQS requirement. And here in, in 1.2, we've got SDLT and its ability to have an audit trail is needed. And that is why we have these tick boxes here that says a third party, i.e. another fee earner or senior partner, property partner, needs to double check that question 10 and question 14 are correct and match with the contract and the transfer deed. And that's just a little example of um, not only data flow, but also double checking that we're not making data um, flow quickly that is not quite right, because sorting it out after the event is, is, a, is an unattractive position to be in, and we want to get it right first time, and that's all about validation. And so there are validation with the government agencies, but there's also validation within the system. So for example, if we put in a date that doesn't make any sense, the system will simply say, hang on, that date doesn't make any sense. Um, and here we can see date cannot be a future date. So that's an example of um, data flow and of validation to ensure the integrity of, of, of that data. And if I go back to my um, Blue Peter prepared earlier, 
version. Here we've got an AP1, so I can convert all of my SDLT data into an AP1, and more, more than that, it can automatically attach the supporting document, which is the SDLT5, and that's it there. And then I can um, go through my form, you'll find that everything's filled in, everything that was a vendor or a purchaser appears as the applicant, as the proprietor, um, and all of the attachments are already attached, or I can add my attachments here, which I've already done in this example, so you can see where it says remove, it's already attached, and, and then I can go e-submit now. So a digital form um, so allows us to... Hear us. Ah. There he is. Sorry? We couldn't um, hear you. you. We'd lost you for a while there, Archie. Oh, sorry. Um, I, well, hopefully I'm, I'm back. Um, well. here, we, here we can see the uh, validation again, and it has said that the, uh, there's a date missing on a form, and it's taken me to that date. I can put in the date. I can save it, and then I can e-submit this. It's checked that it's validated. I can e-submit this now to, to the land reg, and this is currently doing exactly that. This is a digital version of an electronic form that you'll be already familiar with, and it is actually sending it to um, the land registry. And in terms of um, how does one handle how does one handle it when it comes back, this is it accepted. And these are um, the uh, documents straight back out of the land registry. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the land registry could process an AP1 within 30 seconds like it did in that example? Sadly, that's not a reality. And this is a demonstration which fuel injects the process. Um, and that in, in reality, um, there is always several weeks uh, time delay. In terms of replies to requisitions, I just wanted to show you this paper version of what it looks like when you get a requisition. Um, the system will email you to say there are um, some requisitions raised against um, this particular form. And here it is here. And you can click on reply to requisition and you'll get an email showing that it's, it's been done. And um, you'll then get into um, a bit like a WhatsApp conversation. So you can see that you've sent the AP1. They have raised a requisition, you've replied to the requisition, and so forth. And this is the screen where you would um, respond to the land registry, you would engage in a dialogue with them, and, and, and this is all digital. Um, so this is the difference between a digital submission and an electronic form. So that's what it ends up looking like. And you can see here that there's been a requisition raised and that you've replied to it on a certain date and time. So that's um, me coming to a close on the process of digital submissions and um, how they they look in reality. In the Formevo dashboard, you have a, um, a, a traffic light color indicator to show you that anything that is read in the tasks to action is a reminder that something needs to be done about this because it's rejected or it's pending a requisition. If it's pending a requisition, it's the orangey color. And if it's accepted, it comes up in green. Everything that happens in terms of a status change of a, of a form um, is emailed to you. So whether you're within the form system or not, you will always be updated and you'll always know what's going on. And should uh, anybody um, fall um, ill, you can always carbon copy every um, email that has been to do with a rejected submission. You can always carbon copy that into somebody else. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to go on holiday, and I'm going to um, ask that my system automatically carbon copies in Paul uh, for every everything that comes in for the for the next two weeks or whatever it is. So Paul will get a carbon copy of everything. And given that we're all working in separate um, locations, that sort of thing um, makes forms management very uh, manageable and hopefully easy to easy for everybody to use. Um, so I think that's uh, um, me bringing the digital submission part of this presentation to a close and um, uh, hand back to Joe, but I'll leave my screen on share so that if there's any questions that maybe need answering by me showing something on screen, then, then I will do so. 
Um, and uh, Joe, do we have any questions so far? If there are any questions, please do use the chat function and um, and ask them away. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Archie. That was great. We actually do have a couple of questions, which I'm just going to head off because they're actually ones that we get asked quite a lot. Um, the first question is, what level of integration do we actually have? Well, currently it will merge the CN or the user's name as well as the practice details. The good news is, is that we're actually actively working on a higher level of um, integration, so this is very much a work in progress stage. The other question that we have is how does Form Evo compare with what I have? Um, most people have either OEA or laser form, and we do actually have a data sheet showing the comparison that I'd be more than happy to send out to people. Um, you can see on this screen my email address, which is j.paul at quill. .co.uk. Um, so please feel free to ask me any other questions or if you'd like any further information or if you'd like a more detailed demonstration of the forms then I'd be happy to arrange that for you with Paul. Um, so that brings us to a close now. I'd really like to thank you all for your time today and all for listening and just to remind you of the special offer that we have offering the first 90 days of forms free of charge. So thanks again for all your time and stay safe. Goodbye now.